Good morning. How's it going so far? Did you like the music at the beginning, the sort of heroic music you heard as we started this morning? Reassure you, this is not the invasion of Long Island. More good news for you that what's about to happen in this next 17 or 18 minutes will change your life. This is going to be the most inspirational, trend-changing, mind-bending presentation you've ever heard. This presentation is going to be transformative. You're going to be different people 17 and a half minutes from now than you were 30 seconds ago. Do you believe any of that? Maybe little parts of it? Well, what that relates to is that we get so focused on the ways that we describe things that we lose sight sometimes of what's really innovative and what's really entrepreneurial, which always happens in a sequence. It happens as part of a history of things. Most of us, in fact, may have an idea, but it's not necessarily the first time that idea happened in one way or the other. But we're used to saying things that are slight misrepresentations to each other. So how many times have we heard, I'll get back to you on that. Or we hear, this will only hurt a little bit. I'm a physician, so I know about that one. Sometimes it's, I'm totally behind you on this. Really, 100% agree with what you said. And then there's, eh, there'll be just a brief delay on your flight, on the download of your new application, on the transition to your new information system, There'll be just a beef delay, and oh, I know this seems a little weird, but my wife, my husband, my partner, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, they're totally fine with it. So all of these things are little misrepresentations that we make all the time, and sometimes the ones that are most important are the ones we say to ourselves. So the biggest lie you've ever been told, and probably the biggest lie that you'll ever say to yourself is, you did it. You did it. I did it. It was all about me. But in fact, this idea that we had, this thing that we thought about, this next step that we designed, somehow isn't always all about us, even though we say that it was disruptive and world-changing and awesome and effective and it made a big difference in the world. Yet did, but it was part of something beyond us, beyond this moment, beyond this particular frame of this particular idea. So let's think for a moment about whose idea it really is. And we'll think about whose idea it was and whose idea it's going to be because ideas move in this pathway. They have history and they have futures and there's lots of parts of those ideas that get added or put on at various times as those ideas grow up and develop and become something really important and significant. Now this, it turns out, is not just a theory. We've come to know about something called the social brain. What that means fundamentally is that we are wired as human beings to be parts of communities with other human beings. We're wired to want to be with each other and we're wired to share things with each other, especially we're wired to share ideas and thoughts and concepts and hopes and dreams with each other. This has become called the social brain. And it emphasizes that there's no such thing as an individual person sitting in the dark thinking of the next great thing. Individuals think about the next great thing in the context of lots of other individuals with whom they're thinking and meeting, working, ideaing day after day. Turns out that's even true about our own identity. There's been a lot of interest in the field of neuroscience for the past 20 years to try to find out the most basic question. How do I know who I am? How do I know what I is? Who I am? And it turns out the way I know who I am is that I am part of a social network, a social set of brains that periodically give me feedback about who I am. And I reflect myself. I learn about myself in my interactions with lots of other people. And that's especially true about ideas. So ideas kind of move along and get added and people think and understand them differently over time. That's particularly important because it's easy for us to forget that since we're not sitting in the dark, 
we're not doing this all by ourselves, it's also easy for us to forget that we're not everywhere, haven't been in all time, and don't understand the ways that everybody else thinks. So as these ideas move along, as we generate new thoughts and new ways of doing things, we're doing so in a context in which there are people who think differently, whose ways of understanding and expressing things are different than ours. We have a vintage to ideas. Every idea has some cork, if you will, some place that says it started back somewhere. Most of us don't have a way to go back and find all those corks and see where the ideas were necessarily. And then there's the problem of ideas that come from other cultures, other parts of the world that we don't have any connection to. So it's easy for us to think that what we're thinking about, the first time ever, anywhere, in anybody's way of doing, that anybody's thought of that idea. And it might be. But the way we're thinking about it because of our social brains is linked to the way lots of other people have thought about it in the past. So what does not happen is that isolated idea all by itself. What does happen is that my great new idea is part of this chain. It's part of this network. It's part of this growing concept of an idea that's developed over time and over history and in different cultures and in different ways. Sometimes it takes us a while to realize that. Mark Twain, author of Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, and so forth, famously said after not seeing his father for 20 years, yeah, I hadn't talked to the old man, and it's amazing how much he learned in that time. Hmm, really? Who learned what in that time? But the idea that we don't necessarily understand how much has changed before us means that there's a lot, there's a wealth, there's a huge amount of information, ideas, concepts in our social brains that have been developed over time, other places, other cultures. So wouldn't it be nice when we're trying to think about the next big idea, if we had a kind of box and we could put all those other ideas in, things that have been developed before, so that somehow we could have access to those things and know what other people had thought about or done. Wouldn't it be nice if we could think about these ideas and ask questions, if we knew where they were, we could keep them someplace where we could understand them and work on them and come up with the next thing. Might be a lot more efficient, might save us some time, might speed things up some in our own thinking if we had a very clear way of knowing what other thinking had also been done about those things. So we could think about our idea in the context of these other ideas, have access to those other ideas, and then we could come up with something that actually begins to sound new, different, entrepreneurial. So the innovator within is an innovator within a box, if you will, of lots of other ideas. So we think both within and outside the box as we try to come up with the next idea. And then our idea, our part of this becomes part of this chain of thinking, part of the way that ideas develop so that next time someone else will look in the box, if you will, and come up with a different idea and we'll be part of how that happened. So this takes two things. If that's gonna actually work, it takes two things. One is you have to figure out a way to have this box. And the second is you have to figure out a way to be ready to ask the questions about the things that are already there. That's where universities come in. I work with lots of colleges and universities to try to do a very important thing, which is to help them improve outcomes for students. Student learning, we call it. So that students come to college or university, learn the things that will be helpful to them and to the world and to the future, things that will help enable them to be the innovator within, to have the next big idea. And universities are a way to create this storehouse, this warehouse, this library, if you will, of ideas and information. Some other ways to do it too, besides universities, some corporations try to do it, churches, not-profit organizations in some areas try to do it, governments stumble along and try to do it. But the key thing is there's something special about the way universities preserve assets, ideas as assets. And they do it partly because they're not beholden to the same range of influences that affect some other ways that ideas get kept, and they're willing to question over and over and over again. So what a university should do is three things. It ought to be first, not just a warehouse for ideas, thoughts, concepts, it also ought to have good stewardship of them. 
What does it mean to have stewardship? That means you take care of it right. You make sure that these ideas are fed and watered, that they're nurtured, that the assets related to the ideas, whether they're in texts or chemical experiments or things that people talk about, presentations, performances, artworks, whatever they are, universities have a responsibility to be stewards of ideas. And then second, universities have a responsibility to prepare minds to engage with all of those ideas. It's great to have the storehouse, the warehouse, lots of ideas, but you need the next set of people, all of you. The next generation of idea makers and generators have to know what to do with this storehouse, have to be prepared to do it, and we call that having prepared minds. So what's that like? Well, here's my mind. I'm thinking, I have questions, I have some ideas, I wonder. And in this storehouse that universities provide, I can find out how this has been thought about in other minds, other people, other ways. That might inspire me to think or do something differently. And I can also, in the course of all of this, discover the history, the vintage of ideas. I can know the ones that have happened in other parts of the world. And then most important of all, help me turn on the green light. What that means is I have to be ready to do this. Green light means you're ready, right? So one of the things universities do is prepares people's minds to be ready to be innovators, to be ready to be entrepreneurs, to be ready to do the next best thing with the next set of ideas, turn on the green light to thinking, to generating ideas, to creating, to innovation. That means the mind has to be ready, has to be prepared. And that's why universities get focused on how it is they can support students as learners. And that's why higher education really means higher learning, and higher learning means having a prepared mind. That's the most important thing that universities will do for students. It's the most important thing that LIU Post here does for all of you who are students, undergraduate or graduate students here. Prepares your mind. And the prepared mind does some important things. First thing it does is notice. I notice. So sometime, not yesterday, Isaac Newton is sitting under a tree. Apple falls and hits the ground. Lots of apples had fallen and hit the ground a long time before that. You could imagine people watching apples fall out of trees for years, decades, millennia. Maybe now and then one of them looks at each other and says, hey, that's interesting. Look, apple disconnected from the tree, boom. Newton looks at it and says, Hmm, that happened before. I notice again that this happens. I wonder what it is that happens when an apple gets disconnected from the tree and goes boom. So there must be a force. There must be somebody that pulls the apple down. Otherwise, apple would just stay floating there next to the branch it was on. It wouldn't hit the ground. So I notice, I notice again, I wonder. Then I'm going to try and see, so I'm going to hold something else up. I'm going to let go of that thing. Hmm, sure enough, hits the ground. And then a bigger thing. And I notice, maybe, that the bigger and heavier the thing is, the faster it hits the ground. So somehow a prepared mind notices, asks questions, wonders, experiments, tries and sees, tries and sees again, and noticing is at the center of this prepared mind and its relationship to ideas. Great example, back in the early 1980s, a shipping clerk at the Centers for Disease Control who had sent out roughly the same amount of an antibiotic used to treat an infection called pneumocystis pneumonia for years and years. All of a sudden, she noticed, hmm, they need more of that than they used to. Then she notices that was true last month, this month, Wonderfully true next month was. Then she noticed it's all going to two or three places, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York. And it was that observation that began the discovery of what we now call AIDS. The epidemic of HIV and AIDS came from someone noticing our ability to do the marvelous things we can do today started all the way back with somebody noticing that things were different. That's a prepared mind. Third and last thing that universities ought to do is bring all these prepared minds together and let them create. And one of the things that universities do best, should do, must do, have to do, or they fail, is bring 
ideas together in ways that they get tested. We sometimes call that the crucible of ideas. Crucible is a place of their very hot flame, right? They change things. And you'll find out in this crucible of ideas that some of them aren't any good. That big thing that I thought of when I woke up this morning standing in the shower and thought, we should do what? Yeah, and other people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not the best thought you ever had. And somehow in this crucible of ideas, in this storehouse information with lots of prepared minds, it becomes possible for universities to fulfill their highest purpose, which is to make the world different by making students different and creating the ability for students to use all the assets of those institutions to achieve marvelous and sterling things in the world. Well, in summary, what this means is that university plus questions and prepared minds equals the next great idea. So the next great idea is gonna come not just from universities, but especially from the fact that universities create the context in which great ideas will get generated. So, what have I said to you today? What I've said to you is first, if you did it, you didn't do it alone. Now, alone doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't have somebody sitting next to you or not as you thought of this thing, but you didn't do it alone. You're part of a network, a social brain, a social gener generation of ideas, and your idea gets mixed with lots of ideas from other places. So it's important to know that brains are social, that ideas are social. The more brains, the more ideas, the better. Therefore, that's what universities are for. So universities ought to collect ideas and perspectives and prepare brains. They ought to make every student ready to learn. They ought to make it possible for any student to come up with that next step, that next idea. So the standard you ought to hold this university or any other one to is does it do that very well? Does it make it possible for you to think within and outside this box? Does it make it possible for idea generation, creation, testing, the crucible, looking back, looking forward, looking inward, looking outward, all the things that are about what the next idea is about? So that means you are once and future entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs of the future have to embrace the past. Thanks very much. There, behind you. Is there an example of which schools or which universities are doing a better job than other, or maybe what countries are more are doing a better job than other countries, and why? Sure, just to repeat your question in case I really didn't hear it, question about what countries or universities are doing a better job with this. The best thing I can say is that universities that have learned that they too are social, are doing the best example, doing the best and generating the best examples of this. So for example, there is a collaboration of universities around the world called Universitas 21, which includes 25 or 30 world-class world universities who come together in humility to share what they've done and thought about. So universities that are part of that are exemplary because they realize the social nature of idea generation and share a great deal of information. That includes universities like the University of British Columbia in Canada. It includes a few US universities as well, Michigan, Ohio State, and others. But the key thing to say is that you don't have to be big and well-resourced and powerful to achieve this. Other universities that become part of consortia, that share ideas, that have students meet with other students, faculty meet with other faculty, there are lots of ways that that happens in this country as well. So there ought to be idea conferences just as there are athletic conferences. I can't see you, so. <laughs> One question over here. I was just wondering if there were any uh, research or any um, mechanisms that have been found that help people to notice things, you know, things that in, uh, 
help us get into the right mindset, help us to recognize when we're noticing things, help us to prepare ourselves? Uh, great question, and let me, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to defer a little of my answer to some of your other speakers this morning who I think are going to speak directly to that point. And you'll hear a student from LIU who will talk later about taking a break and what that's like intellectually and creatively. But the key thing is that the research does show that ideas best come in what's called a state of relaxed alertness. State of relaxed alertness. Which means what, practically? That means things like, you're not going to have the best idea when you have a headache. You're not going to have the best idea when you're stressed out because of something that happened this morning, had a wreck on the way into the office or the school or the library. You're not going to get your best idea when you don't feel well. A lot of the ideas of being ready to learn are removing those barriers so that people can get into this concept or this, this state of relaxed alertness. Relaxed alertness also means that we have to free ourselves from our most important delusion, which is that we can do two things at the same time. We cannot. There is no such thing as multitasking. We can keep lots of windows open in our minds, but we can only look at one at a time. So as we are talking with one another, meeting, sitting in class, giving a talk, whatever, you can't also be looking at your phone that will make it impossible for you to focus on the other things that you want to think about. So when you read about, what well, you hear about, remember that first video we looked at, photographer who went and lived by himself in the woods so he could focus on his photography. And that doesn't mean we have to turn back into David Thoreau and go live in Walden. It does mean that for the capacity of wonder, curiosity, noticing to occur, it has to have space. We have to create that space in our lives as busy as they are you don't have the best idea there ever was while you're trying to do three things at the same time. Let's take one more question. Bright's right all the way right behind you. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you see as the difference between teaching and learning. And I ask that question because I think that we as teachers much too often concentrate on teaching and not enough on learning. So anything you, ha you have to say about that would be much appreciated. How long do we have? <laughs> the, 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 that's a, it's a fabulous question, and briefly I'll say this, that the focus on teaching, which has been true in not just US, but most countries, particularly in K-12 systems, but also in colleges for decades, has been on what we call pedagogy. That is, how do you best teach? meaning what are the materials, what is the order, what's the sequence, how much can people take at a time, that is, what is it you want to convey. And this is focused on the educator, the teacher, as an effective person. But we thought about effective in relation to what that person does without looking at the other end of the relationship, which is what the student learns. So those of us who've taught have embarrassing memories, no doubt, of having given lectures or whole courses, thinking that we had conveyed X, Y, Z to students, and then discovering later that, oh, they didn't get that at all. Or they didn't pick that, we thought we said something else. A classic example comes from the famous anti-drug campaign. You remember the one that said, this is your brain on drugs, and there was a frying pan and scrambled eggs and things? Turns out that what middle schoolers learn from that is that eggs are a drug. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> But this focus on what people um, who are students, learners, are getting from the encounter is a focus on what, not just what information is received, but how that's processed, understood by the people who are learners. The last thing I'll say, this is where the real opportunity is, for us to stop thinking about those definitions, teacher, student, teacher, learner, so rigidly. And we'd love to have learning happen where the professor, the teacher, the student, are continuously rethinking what it means to learn. And the professor learns along with the students, things get better for the next year, et cetera. And that relationship is where the best higher learning would happen. Excellent. Thank you again, Dr. Kaling. How about another round of applause for Dr. Kaling? Thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic.